All right. Um, so I'm Morgan Crossman. I'm the executive director of Building Bright Futures. And I'm excited to spend some time today, just as Dora said, talking about the broader vision for how we think about early childhood data in Vermont. And for those of you who might be newer to the committee, a part of the charge of this committee is really thinking about and talking about the ways that we can tell the full story of the impact that our system is making on kids and families. And um, this committee helps us hold that vision on behalf of the state. So I can't see more than about half of you, so this won't work as well, but how many of you feel like you currently know what the vision is for early childhood data across the system? That's good. That's why we're gonna have five minutes on that this morning or this afternoon. So. Um, as we're thinking about data, one of the things that we've talked about at Building Bright Futures is how, how we how we tell people what data is. Yes, data is a number. Yes, data is experiences and stories and how we communicate qualitatively about the impact. But as we're thinking about Vermont's vision, and I apologize for not having slides today, I will follow up with the group about some of that work. But the broad vision that we have is multifaceted. The first is that Vermont's going to develop stronger systems for how we monitor the early childhood system and link data so that we have a full picture of the landscape and that we can understand the relationship between the individual service utilization and access to programs, but also cross-sector and longitudinal outcomes. So that first piece of the vision is thinking about, and this group being the primary people who are either collecting that data or thinking about data or who are sorting and compiling that data, how do we make sure that Vermont has access to consistent data on, for example, the number of kids who are being served across sectors? What are the gaps in equitable access um, for kids? What services and how are they impacting kids and under what conditions for which families? And then how do we use that information to allocate resources to better meet the needs of kids and families? So again, it's really about thinking through data collection, compiling, and then linking that data to support kids and families. Um, and I think what's important about this group is many of you are the ones that are connected to the data on children's experiences across departments, across divisions, agencies, or private partners who are capturing that information. And so as we think about the policy questions that we could answer in that space, again, it's around availability and utilization and quality and gaps and relationships and being able to track kids and cohorts. And so how do we think about organizing that information to understand the systems? So again, that first part of the vision is what are our systems? How do we strengthen systems to monitor the vision and link data across entities? The second is actually using that data to drive decision-making. So how do we support Vermont policymakers, practitioners, and others to track early childhood outcomes and services, measure the return on investment, inform the planning and thinking about and driving continuous quality improvement for the system. It's going from, we know what the challenge is, we have data to understand that, and now how do we match resources to the needs and then continuously evaluate that impact. The third is how do we make that data publicly available and meaningful? Right. So how do we how do we actually tell the story? How do we centralize information in a meaningful way? Um, and a lot of that work is happening in this space. It's happening in each of your different entities. And then it's uh, drawing together all of that data across those sectors and making it publicly available through Vermont's Early Childhood Data and Policy Center as a space to make it accessible and the partnerships that we're using. And all of that work is really about improving the well-being of kids and families, right? Not just collecting data to collect data, but really to be moving in the direction of how are we improving outcomes and access for kids. So before, um, before I move any further, I want to really quickly take a look at the chat because I am seeing a couple of comments in here. 
Yes. So I'm seeing a couple of comments around strategic planning across the agencies, departments, and divisions around um, the different statements around data. I'm seeing uh, how we how we draw on lessons learned in the past. And actually, that's part of the exercise that we are going to do this morning or this afternoon, which is having a conversation around how we make progress. And in order to do that, we need to discuss and document all of the ways we as a state have attempted to document and link and coordinate or integrate data. And that's where this group comes in. Um, so before, before I move on into that, that piece of that exercise, what questions do folks have and what might be missing from your perspective about that broader uh, vision for early childhood data as a whole? And so Jay, your comment, your comment is really important. And I think this is where, yes, we have um, statements through the Department of Health. We have strategic plans across every agency, department, and division in state government for how we think about supporting kids and families from that specific lens. And a part of building Bright Futures role is holding the vision and strategic plan for the entire early childhood system, both for the policy, but also for the data. And so that's where this group is so instrumental in being able to say, okay, um, I'm with, you know, the Vermont Department of Health, or I'm with the Child Development Division or the Agency of Education, and here's how we think about it. Here's what we are doing and using in our strategic goals and how we're measuring. But then it's coming back into the space to say, okay, everybody is doing this work in their silo based on their discrete role and responsibility. And that's really important. How do we centralize that information? How do we think about linking it to tell a more full story about our kids and our families and how do we do it over time? All right, any questions? Go ahead, Anne. Um, I think maybe this discussion will happen later, but um, when you ask what's missing, I think you said a lot, you covered a lot of things in the vision and it was very well and succinctly said. And um, we need, I don't know if it's public will or commitment or buy-in or what the word is, but it, there has to be a commitment to give time um, and to prioritize that vision. Yeah, great point, Anne. And, you know, I think here's here's where I'm going to try to inspire a little bit of excitement in this group to say, you are the ones in state government who are prioritizing this in your in your silos. And a part of my job is to make sure that all of the senior leaders across the state understand the vision, can deputize and provide time and support to do this work. And a part of what we did under the preschool development grant was build in state government capacity across departments and divisions to help free up time to collaborate and to be in this space. Um, so today's conversation is really with the data partners, not necessarily the policy, the, the policy leaders or the commissioners. And we are having that same conversation with that group in April to make sure that they understand and are aligned and have that same level of commitment and buy-in because the work this, this group is doing is so instrumental and you're all working so incredibly hard to collect and compile high quality data and to report on it and to do all those things. And now how do we together have a better understanding of how we can link and, and do this work together? So I agree with you, Anne, that is a really important piece of it. Kaya. So um, I think one of the things that we should really grapple with and, and try to figure out, as I always say, is how are we going to hold in gathering data for smaller populations? Yeah. Because it always gets hidden and it always, we disappear. That's what I'm going to say is those of us who belong to these groups disappear as if our issues and the things that we need are unimportant. And I'm really tired of hearing, well, your numbers are too small and it's going to break confidentiality. You know, at this point, I'd waive confidentiality if someone gave you that option of saying, do are you willing to waive a chance that you might be identified? Do it just so I can get counted properly. 
Yeah. I, so here's what I really appreciate about this group. You're already jumping into problem solving and what the opportunities are, which I, I we will get to, I promise. And that is exactly the type of thinking. The other thing that I see in the chat by some of our longstanding partners is what happened to Data Governance Council? And that's what we're going to talk about. We're really excited about it. So again, for those of you who have been around and we're here for different iterations, we're leaning on your expertise to say, hey, here are all the things we've tried as a state to, to think about linking and coordinating early childhood data so that we can document it and have the lessons learned and then really reorient our new state agency leaders to that vision and actually make progress and, and build on some of that work. Because what has happened over time is that sometimes large federal grants come into the state of Vermont and start these amazing things that then are no longer people's jobs or we don't have the capacity or the sustainability built in to maintain. Data Governance Council was one of those things. And so now really looking to this group as the experts in this to say what worked, what didn't, what have we tried, how are you thinking about it, and then moving into what are the opportunities. Go ahead, Jay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I Firstly, I wanted to, to echo what Kaya said. That is a, such an important point um, about um, making sure that, that people who are in groupings that are have small numbers are not erased completely from the data. Um, secondly, I, I went to a, a really great webinar from the um, Council for State Governments Justice Center. Um, I put the link in the chat, um, but they were discussing um, a new policy tool that enables people to evaluate where their state is at in terms of their collaboration between mental health and criminal justice and carceral system mm -hmm. um, services and um, see how those systems can better collaborate to meet the needs of people with um, behavioral health needs who are, are involved in the criminal justice system because frequently we see people with mental health needs cycling in and out of incarceration and not getting their mental health needs or their substance use disorder needs met. And it's just a really vicious cycle with with um, poor outcomes for everyone involved. So, um, but that policy module, uh, policy tool, is a really great thing. But one of the things that the folks on the webinar said when they were sharing their experience that informed the um, the creation of various uh, multi-sectoral collaborative um, bodies was that um, the, uh, they really couldn't get it done without a dedicated um, permanent uh, body with multi-sectoral stakeholders and the enough resources to have a coordinating, you know, kind of program manager or um, uh, director of services kind of position to, to get it done. Um, because, yeah, this is extremely complicated work and there just needs to be someone uh, steering the ship, so to speak. Um, and they also said that it was really important to make sure to have involvement and input from people with lived experience in the carceral system, people with lived experience of having substance use disorders or um, being incarcerated, having uh, been involuntarily committed in a mental health institution, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, that's those are the points that I wanted to highlight, making sure that there are resources dedicated to this process, having the multi-sectoral involvement and um, having people with lived experience at the table. Um, guiding the guiding the data integration process. And um, I would love to hear about the data governance work uh, from the race to the top grant cycle, because I um, it's been two years that I've been at my current position at the State of Vermont Office of Racial Equity, and uh, I was not involved in that project. So I'd love to learn more. Awesome feedback, Jay. Much appreciated. And thank you for sharing that tool. Um, I, I haven't heard about this tool, but it's very interesting because we've used um, just recently a, a different tool to look across all of the agencies, departments, and divisions supporting kids and families in state government and had them had them essentially do a, an exercise where we asked them to rate their ability to go from, you know, 
competing for resources, collaboration, coordination, communication, all the way up to integration and really looking at, you know, as you think about your role in state government, and as you think about uh, the vision of moving towards an integrated system that has aligned and shared vision, where do you think we are and how, how far do you think we've come, but how far do we still need to go um, as one way of really trying to understand the effectiveness of some of the, the structures that we're building. So I'm really interested to look more into this and see how this can help us understand, um, how it can help us understand the, the early childhood space as well. And I think um, for the moment, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that Building Bright Futures does have the capacity and now some resources to be able to be that centralizing, coordinating body for the state in a really powerful way. And we're really looking to this group as at least from that data perspective, not necessarily all of us with the lived experience piece, but the data knowledge and cross-sector experience to say, here's what we know about what, what has happened in that space to think about data integration. Here are the opportunities. Here's where it's already happening. And um, here's how we're currently thinking about it. Here's what's worked well, and here's what's absolutely failed that we cannot try again. How do we think about those things? Um, so I think that we're, we're in a really amazing space to re-engage in those conversations in a different way. And it will still, it'll still be a very long process to make sure that we have the right people at the table and can move. Go ahead, Dora. I just want to say it's, it's not just BBF capacity that through uh, the preschool development grant, I think it's two FTEs across four or five wow. agencies. Um, so it's not, it's not um, so it's, it's really exciting that we actually do have, um, do have this time and the personnel who are going to be able to, to support the work, um, in a way that I think even the data governance work that started under that, that was done under race to the top, um, it, it wasn't able to, to move forward and sort of reach its potential, um, and, ha and has been sitting on a shelf for five years. So again, I think um, the the way that we would like to be talking about this work, especially with this group, is that we are all a part of thinking through how we'd want to move it forward. And then, you know, BBF really serving in the way of here's how we're going to continue to coordinate and move this effort and really be the driving force around bringing public and private partners together to make this happen in a in a meaningful way. So we're really excited about that effort. And I'm recognizing the time and want. I really want to hear uh, from all of you about where we've been. So, you know, several things have already been mentioned in the chat. I invite you to write in the chat, Dora. I'm not sure if we still want to use a, a table or have just a more organic discussion because we have um, such an awesome group right now. But what, what I want you to be thinking about and discussing as a group is what are all of the ways that you know about as a state that we have talked about or started or tried to link data, to coordinate data, to think about integrating data? Um, and so the things that, again, that have already been mentioned that might come to mind are things like the Data Governance Council. Like, are there formal meeting structures that were in place or groups that came together that were effective or not? Um, are there data systems that you are thinking about or that are coming to mind that are sparking your ideas for how, how you're thinking about linking data? Um, are there current efforts underway or already happening to link data? So for example, one that I know about is in af the after school space, right? Where there are um, coordination efforts between the child development division, the agency of education and Vermont after school to, and, and, a, um, and a private entity really talking about how to take all of the after-school data across all of these sectors and compile it and then have a more integrated ability to look across the different entities to see what we know and don't know in the after-school space and about service provision. What is coming to mind for you all? Anne and Brina, I'd love to, to have you go first just because I, I know some of the things that, I, that you plan to talk about. I'd really like this group to hear more about what's been done. Dave Kelly too, I'm thinking about Eric, like others who are in that space. Uh, I could start at Anne's correct. You know, we, we had a, um, can you guys hear me? 
It's like a funny thing. We had a consultant from Texas named Nancy who um, met with us every week for three years. <laughs> and what she really, she came from the education world. So she uh, had to sort of learn the complexity of early childhood human service world. And she outlined what we would need to do and left us with the plan. And then Anne is correct that the uh, leadership commitment wasn't there for adequate. I really appreciate what Jay said to the, I think it was Jay, the lack of funding or capacity here is the current theme in my head from the 25 years of trying to do this. But the other thing I'll represent just while I'm unmuted is there's a lot of different ways to frame this conversation. You can frame it by, uh, you know, pregnancy, birth, like what we call life course, like where are the opportunities uh, based on where you are in the life course. But over the years, I preferred to frame it of sort of where are the kids and sort of and the families. And so starting with healthcare at the bottom, because sort of almost everyone has health access uh, or at least, you know, we have very high rates of pediatric health care and then figuring out how you want to uh, diagram out then all the programmatic data. So as a public health person, there's population health data sets that are uh, available, but often kind of sweeping. And then there's all the different programs that we do and and. I think the observation sitting at the health department all those years, there's just piles and piles and piles of data and uh, the capacity to inventory that and then also uh, do anything with it has been an afterthought. And then the, the true last thing I'll say is that VCHIP, the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program, Elisa at the health department actually asked us to do a comprehensive inventory of pediatric measurement this year, which is uh, not, it's all kids, not just early childhood. And so we're, I've been texting with Elisa while we're on this, that Dora, we really need to double around with you quickly so that we have a shared understanding of, uh, so far we're at 86 data sets, <laughs> if anybody wants to know that. And it, but it's finally, finally saying, you know, there's things that population data tells us, there's things that claims in medical care tells us, and then there's WIC and Dulce and childcare and, you know, 86 times, I will not do that verbally. And uh, Kaya, your um, point is very well taken. Uh, we have trouble describing uh, health disparities and other disparities in our state because of small numbers. And uh, I appreciate what you said. I think there's a lot of uh, data ethics and integrity that have to meet with sort of common sense in that space. So thanks for bringing that up. Sure, it's Kaya, not Kaya. Oh, th thanks. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So and I will just respond really quick. I'm jumping, but because I'm going to sit there and bang that gong again of we may have lots of data. However, we are not figuring out or have not figured out figured out a way to attest to the quality of the care for groups that are underrepresented or that don't seem to have a voice. And that includes like maternal care. You know, the our rate of maternal mortality in this country is disgraceful. And then when you start digging into underrepresented groups, it gets worse. And the same thing happens with pediatrics. Yeah, we may be making the visits, but are our needs being met? So it's, I think it's, to me, data, I'm a data head and I love data, but I think this is just so much bigger in some ways. And you, you hit the nail on the head when you said the ethics. And I don't want us, as a state to get blinded to, oh, wow, 90% of kids have a, a pediatrician, okay? And does that is that pediatrician culturally competent? Do they understand the different groups that they're working with? Because just going to the doctor in and of itself is great, but it doesn't always work. 
Case in point, me, I have diabetes. When I was first diagnosed, what was I told by my doctor, literally as, as they were walking out the door, don't eat rice. And I'm like, okay, that was really helpful, especially considering that I'm Indian and from India, and that's the basis of my diet. <laughs> so, so that's what I have to say. Thank you, Kaya. And thank you, Brina. I think one of like one of the things that we are taking notes on behind the scenes and obviously recording today is talking about the number of data sources, talking about what we mean when we say data and how we think about both numbers, but also the qualitative experiences and how we're capturing that, which is which is not the same as just linking and centralizing data, right? It's really thinking about how we're gathering high quality data on experiences, especially for the youngest and most vulnerable kids and families on behalf of the system? And, and how do we think about what we need to measure in order to understand that impact? Mm -hmm. Anne? Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, um, Morgan, that, you know, I have a lot to say on this topic, but um, I think one of the things, and you have all the records about this, <laughs> is the Vermont Insights effort. And I know now we have the Early Childhood Data and Policy Center. The idea about Vermont Insights was that it was a data reporting infrastructure. So it wasn't, you know, um, bring all the data into one warehouse, but can we can we share, um, bring it together to, re to make reports? Um, so even for a short time, uh, I'm not using the technical language for it. And having the mapping function in that, having Head Start data, AOE data, um, AHS data, health department, you know, we had um, CDD. I think there was a lot of progress with that. And I think sustainability and funding to keep that going and staffing. Um, you know, same thing with the Data Policy Council. And so, I appreciate that there's new capacity through the PDG and that's certainly very helpful. And I liked what you said that we have new leadership that we can orient. And I think that's critical. So I'm glad to hear your meeting also, you know, with commissioners and at that level. Um, we also had a list of, you mentioned policy questions. Um, in the beginning, we talked about them as essential questions. And then I think they did, move to policy questions, but, um, you know, we looked, we had those kind of layers of looking at child, family, workforce, and community, and I'm really hopeful that we can keep all those aspects. I know there's been a big focus on, on workforce, and um, that data is important, too, as well as outcomes for children and families, um, and uh, I think that the um, there's one thing I wanted to say about the, um, well, I guess there were two more things I want to say about the, um, Data Governance Council. We had, um, there was work on, I can't remember what they were called, maybe, you know, pr uh, pilot projects or test things. And there were a th questions people wanted answered with cross-sector data. And, um, I think really looking at what, what happened with those projects would be very important because that's where the rubber hits the road, right? There's an ask and then what? Um, and I did want to say there are, I know you know this Morgan, but there are small pockets where um, data is coming together. You know, just for one example, um, we have uh, the CIS state team has regular meetings now with the, um, BDH, family and child health, uh, um, sustained home visiting data folks. And we're looking at aligning, you know, the data we report in the CIS semi-annual report with the data they report for their, for the McB funds. And, you know, how can we um, do some shared reporting? So that kind of thing is helpful. I think Let's Grow Kids has brought together CDD and AOE data um, to look at enrollment and capacity in early childhood education. And um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's possible, but I really don't want to, you know, just um, go 
down the same path without very, you know, eyes wide open about what might be some glitches that need to be worked out. Thanks, Anne. And I, I think, Anne, a few of the things that you mentioned, I, I want others to be thinking in that direction. What are what are the ways that your entities are collaborating or connecting, right? Like what are the, the existing connection points where we we're working in that area? What are what are those big efforts, right? Like we talked about Vermont Insights. We now have a new early childhood data portal where we do have all of that data on behalf of all of the agencies that is publicly available and centralized. Um, I haven't heard anyone mention the state longitudinal data system that AOE is managing yet, right? Like there, there were some really big efforts that had taken place. And that's really what we want you all to be helping us brainstorm, right? Like what are the things that we have done? Where do we need to not replicate something that didn't work, right? How, how do we actually build on the 70 pages of data governance council work that I have both printed and in a, right? How do we build on what's been done in the right way based on the current vision and the current energy and the current leadership, right? There, there are different ways to do this. And I think what, what we're saying is we want you to be partners in that and, and help us learn so that we aren't duplicating things that didn't work. Emily. A lot of what I was going to say, you just reiterated and Anne touched on, so I will shorten my spiel. But um, I think in line with that, it's just, it's really important to know where we've been before we take leaps forward, because it's it, it's unethical for us to be using money and resources and time and implementing things that if we had done our due diligence, we know from our past mistakes don't work. Um, so taking the time to take a step back and get down to fundamentals and do some inventorying of what we've done before and why it didn't work. Um, I think that, you know, that, that is the most responsible approach, but, um, I wanted to elevate efforts at VDH that are being undertaken under the, uh, data governance council group of, um, indicator inventorying across all of our divisions. Um, Again, it's it's not like to that level of data linking, but it's a repository that's really useful to understand where there might be overlaps in either content area, populations, methodologies, um, or a, a number of other criteria. So having that picture across the public health space, I think is uh, really important and that's currently underway. It's not published yet. So nothing really, concrete to share. Um, but I just wanted to elevate that that effort is being supported and uh, we're seeing some some great data come out of this inventory already. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Boy, I feel like I'm hogging time here today and beating the same drum. I wanted to respond to the comment that Eric had which was on my comment and what is small enough to be useful. And when we start thinking this way, we're still buying into the structure set up by white supremacy because why, why can't we have the same access as groups that are white is really what it boils down to. What's small enough to be useful? Yeah, that's what we have to do. We, that we have to figure out, but I also just want to call out if we're really looking for equity and trying to increase or better health outcomes, we should have the exact same data for all groups, which I know realistically we can't, but ethically I want us to be thinking and struggling with this and saying, how do we do this so we do get the same data so we can compare these groups and see what's happening. So thanks. Thank you, Kat. And yeah, thank you, Eric and others. Go ahead, Eric. No, I was just going to say I appreciate that clarification. And you know, I'm I'm with you on principle, but you know, it's bringing practice to that same level. That's our challenge. It is, but I think part of our, our job 
at least part of my job, let me put it this way, is to challenge these things and is to be at the structures that ensure health inequities occur. And until we really start thinking that way, we're not going to get the data we need to affect system-wide change. I appreciate that, one. Thank you, Kaya. I'm getting my um, now less than five minute warning on this discussion, but I, I really appreciate the time. And I, I guess what I would invite is like, I, I know our AOE partners are on today and others that we haven't heard from yet. Are there, are there other data systems or opportunities? And I, I'm also missing Renee Kelly in this space for those of you who know the, the work that she and AOE and others have done on um, thinking about, about linking data on children um, in Head Start and Early Head Start with special education services and um, IDEAC, but what are all of those other opportunities or things that we have tried as a state as we've thought about how to link data, as we've thought about um, compiling data in different ways, as we've thought about or attempted to bring the right people together? Are there any major lessons learned from those of you who, again, have been in this space and tried 18 different things so that we don't duplicate the wrong things or make sure that we are documenting some of the other things that have been tried in, in really intentional ways. What else comes to mind for you all? Go ahead, Dave. Um. I guess one thing for me is that the actual physical linking data is simple in terms of if I have identity information and two sets of data, I can link it and I can assign IDs and I can store it somewhere. Um, the hard part of all this is sort of the data use and uh, MOU between instances. Um, you know, I think one of the things that AOE did that was um, somewhat successful is to have a universal or a, an umbrella agreement with AHS for data exchanges. So that means when we go and move forward with a new agreement in health or wherever it might be, that there's less work to do there. And that might also equate to less time spent on that startup cost. Um, you know, data governance is, your data governance project is not the only one that's ever ended up on a shelf, right? Like it's easy to put a data governance project on a shelf because um, not all the structures are general fund. They're grant funded or they're project funded. And so they, that, that the question then is how do we make sure a data governance program becomes general fund. Maybe it's not a popular point of view. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I think Dave, Dave and James, like your your team has been really instrumental in that space. And I think there are, you know, in future meetings and maybe even smaller groups, a lot of a lot of lessons learned from thinking about trying to link Head Start and IDA data and um, the conversations that that have taken place over time, especially between the child development division and the agency of education in unique IDs and thinking about um, that body of work. So I, I do think that in some cases, we're not giving ourselves enough credit for all of the things we've tried, but one of the themes that keeps coming up is capacity, sustainability, funding, right? Leadership and intent and drive political will to be able to do those things. And that's that's what I'm really hoping to shift and inspire in our, our new leaders in a different way. But again, really, really want to make sure that we are are understanding what's been done. Go ahead, Carly. Yeah, it was actually um, that was a, a perfect segue. I was going to talk about just a similar approach. I think that um, I'm I'm experiencing a bit in family services is the data sharing agreements um, in order to kind of transfer and share data. Right, we don't have systems that speak to each other. Um, but we have a lot of other departments or uh, even folks external reaching out to say, hey, you know, we can we give you this data set and then can you give us back what you have on it 
and then they're able to get to some outcomes. We're, we're doing this right now. Alyssa, um, who's also on this call, is working with uh, folks from Dale, the Department for um, Aging and Independent Living, uh, because they make um, reports at times for youth who they oversee um, who may also be in uh, custody of family services, right? And so they're wanting to know what's the outcome of this? How are these children faring? And so we're working with grants and contracts to set up set up um, a data sharing agreement where they can send us the data set. We can then um, send back what we have. And then they're going to use that to kind of inform their approach around uh, around that population. So I think in the absence of um, systems that talk to each other, we're just, we're seeing a more manual approach, at least for us. Um, and then that really comes with exactly uh, what we were just talking about was um, capacity, right? That's a lot of manual lookups for family services. Um, and, you know, it can be hundreds of kids at times, depending on the data set, uh, you know, yeah, just it can be quite a, quite a significant lift. And that's where the challenge comes in to, right? We want to we wanna do as much of that as we can. And we still have all the other things that we're, we're having to, to juggle with it. Um, so, you know, hopefully a few years from now, we'll have a new system and it'll be less of an issue. But in the meantime, we do a lot of manual lookups so that we can be connecting, um, connecting the dots, understanding service impact, understanding, uh, you know, yeah, how the delivery around the state is, is happening. So things we're, we're trying out here. I'm so hopeful for your team, Carly, on that data system front as well. So thank you for sharing. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Tiffany, we'll go to you and then I will wrap this section for us. Oh, sure. Thank you, Morgan. Um, I, I just have um, kind of a suggestion. Um, I know that this is a big process ahead. I'm hopeful. Um, I think where I like to start is trying to figure out, you know, what are the you know, um, you know, defining certain research questions, but also um, giving giving the agencies kind of a um, a request or ask for data frames, or even to know what's what kind of data they're collecting, because I, I feel like that can help to set the stage. Um, because I know the MOU process, all of that has to go through in terms of data sharing and all that good stuff. Um, but I think also that gives us maybe um a little bit of a head start um, to trying to see what data is already um, in place without necessarily asking for the data set. So that could be a way to start to think about how do we link between different agencies? Um, you know, I know, I know it's going to be a lengthy process, but at least we can, if we can start to see, well, what agencies um, need to be approached and then start to have that that conversation in terms of kind of you know what does your IT system look like and or you know what what you know can you provide an Excel spreadsheet of the you know the um, the items or information that you collect and then we can see okay we can link it this way but that could be a really really good first step and I think I I do take um, I do appreciate the comments thus far I think it's a really good conversation. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And I know um, the Office of Racial Equity is really diving into the, that um, data governance space and really thinking critically about how we how we make sure we're asking the right questions. How do we think about data from a, a statewide perspective? And um, this is where it, it is really interesting because we have so many new partners in the space, new leaders, new data stewards, new new energy in this area, and so much of that work has happened in the past. And we have a lot of that information documented through the original Early Childhood Data Governance Council work. Um, that full list of here are all of the questions. There were um, lengthy lists and, and cases that agencies actually worked through to think about where to link data and what those um, what those cases were and how we, how we map and thinking about those data systems that now I would say, that is the starting place and really coming back in um, and kind of resetting and reinvigorating that conversation around, are these still the same questions? Do we have new questions? What, um, and I think that for those of you who have been a part of BBF in the last couple um, or the last, I would the last couple of years, we've been doing some of that work through building data development agendas, picking different concrete topic areas and saying, okay, 
What are the major questions we have in this area? What data do we have? What are the gaps and limitations? Which entity holds that information? And what, what do we still not have available? And how do we think about that information? So I think we're we are starting to build back into that vision for data and systems change and data change is a long process. And I really appreciate Dave Kelly saying we have had really amazing federal grants come in to support the work and then it gets shelved. And so how how do we start thinking about that work, not just at the um, data and evaluation committee, but again, thinking about it as a state and as a whole for what it means for us to understand um, who we're making an impact for, and then how we allocate resources to help um, support our ability to improve the well being of kids and families. All right, I'm going to pause because we're already five minutes over this section, but I really appreciate the discussion today. And what we're going to do is follow up um, either with a template that folks can. And can fill in or an email where you can share additional information about, again, you know, what you, what you know about in terms of where the state has attempted or has moved in the, in the space of linking and integrating data, what types of data systems we've seen or what formal meeting structures have been successful, being able to name some of the lessons learned and the challenges, but also what you think some of those opportunities might be. Um, and this won't be the only time that we're talking about it. Just the, happens to be the first time this year. So I appreciate the time. Thanks all. Really appreciate the the starting the conversation. As Morgan said, we'll be we'll be sending out a request for more information. And this is, um, you know, again, it's funded by the preschool development grant, but again, building on lots of building on lots of uh, previous work and trying to trying to learn learn lessons. So uh, that has been heard loud and clear. Um, I'm going to pass it this over to Carolyn and Eric to talk about CDD's upcoming market rate survey. Hi everybody, um, I'm Carolyn Long. I'm the Director of Operations for the Child Development Division and um, also here with Eric, uh, who I think y'all know. He's the Senior Process and Performance Analyst for the Child Development Division. Um, and we wanted to just talk about the micro market rate survey, but I'd like to just give you a little background to what that is and why we need to do it. And then kind of just talk about our methodology and our path forward and then um, would love to get feedback. It doesn't have to be today, but as you kind of think about it um, and process what we've um, spoken about, uh, we'd be open to receiving feedback um, anyway through email or a call or, or some sort. So um, we are getting ready, the Child Development Division is getting ready to compile our um, Child Care Development Fund state plan, CCDF state plan. The state plan um, outlines how we administer our CCFAP program um, and also uh, how we do it in accordance with the federal regulations. Um, has many sections to it. It's kind of about compliance and following the rules and the laws. Um, and part of this state plan is what's called the market rate survey. Um, it's a little deceiving because it can be a survey or it can be done with administrative data. So this market rate survey um, looks at what providers charge families and then helps the state to look at that and to set provider rates. Um, so when we do the market rate survey, we do it with our administrative data that we have in-house that we collect within CDD. Um, we, all providers, do still um, submit a provider rate agreement, which tells us how much they charge families, um, both private pay and, and subsidy families. Um, now that we have our, our, our set rates, it's, it's a little bit easier to kind of comprehend. Um, and then we kind of, we data mine that. We look at it in lots of different ways. Um, we... Um, pull out like some key findings and key things. And then we also um, look at it at different percentiles, right? The highest level of care um, and how much that, how much uh, providers charge to, you know, the, to the lowest level of care and how much providers charge. Um, so 
with that, um, I am going to actually uh, put, put our last year's market rate survey in the chat just so that folks have that and are able to view it. Um, this year, we're going to be doing really the same thing. We're going to use the same methodology. We're going to kind of follow the same report structure that we did last year. Um, also within the market rate survey, there's what's called a narrow cost analysis, which is which outlines the cost of care um, that providers um, have for their um, for their centers or their home based care. Um, typically, what has happened in the past is that we have gone out to providers and kind of looked at this with them and um, kind of done an analysis uh, that way. This year, um, two things. We are going to actually use the RAND study that was done um, in the legis for the legislature um, last session um, that outlined the cost of care for them in order to set the rates um, for this upcoming past year. Um, we will do that for this, this um, report. However, we at Child Development Division are currently um, crafting a request for proposal for a um, methodology and yearly update to this cost of care for providers so that we have that information up to date every year for, for our own use, for the legislature's use, for you know everybody can see what the actual cost of care is for um, providers. We just won't have that ready for this year. So with Rand having done it just um, just a, not a couple of years ago, we're going to be using what they've done um, to submit with this report. Um, so I think what we're looking for, I'm happy to take questions, but we just wanted to run this by you. I think this is a great group to talk about this um, at and also um, to receive feedback because you all know data very well, um, you know, the provider community very well, um, just to receive feedback. Um, I'll stop there. Eric, would you like to add anything um, to this? No, I think you covered it pretty well. But yeah, what's in there is in the, uh, the previous report that you linked to. I think I just say that, not that it's really relevant, I suppose, but we are going to change the timeline a little bit. We're not going to be looking at fall payment data any longer. We're going to go back to the beginning of the year when we increased our rates, when we changed our structure to pay the state rate as opposed to the past where we, you know, we had a certain capped rate we'd pay up to. And if the provider charged less than that rate, then we paid the lower amount. So when we switched our practice over to just paying, you know, the state rate, whatever it, whether it was higher or lower, we want this report to reflect the current situation. So it's not going to be directly comparable to prior reports because our, you know, our systems change a little bit. But anyway, just me babbling a bit. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Um, I just did it, um, include the link to what is the RAND report. It's really called the um, Vermont Early Care and Education Financing Study. Um, so my apologies, like the brand was the group that did it. Um, so I often refer to it as that, um, but it is, I did put that in the chat as well for folks to reference. Um, um, Eric, when you said beginning of the year, did you mean the state fiscal year or the calendar year? Or um, you said that you were looking at beginning of the year payment data when, when some rates increased? Carolyn, do you remember exactly what date that was that we switched to that? So our last provider um, increase was in December. Yeah. December so, 17th. Yeah. So I, I was thinking of January just since it's, you know, beginning of the calendar year and right after we changed. Right. We want to reflect our current rates to what, yeah, what what is actually being, what is out there. So sorry, Eric, go ahead. I said we had a lot of providers submit rates when that happens uh, who had not previously had rates on file with us. And a lot more people suddenly wanted it in. So got a lot more data to draw from than if we went back to September. I know that was a lot of information. Um, 
but we're happy to, like I said, happy to, once you kind of can think about it, we're happy to take suggestions um, and comments about um, some useful information that we could include um, or not include in the report. It will look a little bit different because obviously the information will be updated. Some of it's based on star level and um, as you may or may not know, uh, we're not, payment is not based off of star level anymore. Um, so that'll be reworked a little bit. All right. Well, I will, um, I can put, I'll put my email address in the, um, chat. So if folks do want to um, provide feedback, that's great. We're happy to have a call or a conversation um, at any point. Is there a new quality measure that payment is based on? Um, they're not. For the provider rate, there is no quality um, measure for that um, from, for many reasons. Um, we still do have the STARS level that uh, providers do have a rating on, but they are all paid at um, the same rate now. There is a difference between registered homes or um, family child homes versus uh, registered centers, so still. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody. Jay. Um, I, I was actually, I just muted myself and raised my hand because I felt like I was interrupting. So thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I reviewed that the bill that got rid of the stars, um, the payments based on star systems. And I actually did sort of a deep dive into like, what is the stars system? How is it, um, potentially reinforcing, um, systemically racist ideas of quality and quality measurement and, um, I ended up making the uh, writing in the bill review on behalf of our office that um, that it the star system, the payments based on the star system were concerning because the star system did not have a very good correlation between um, predictions of quality and like the actual childhood outcomes. So like mm -hmm. it would predict good quality, but not necessarily good outcomes for the kids en enrolled in those programs. And um, it did seem like it was giving a big advantage to um, organizations with enough staff capacity to maintain the reporting requirements and not necessarily um, giving smaller childcare providers the opportunity to earn a better STARS rating because of that administrative burden. So um, yeah, I just wanted to provide that context that I was actually really pleased to see that the, the payments were decoupled from the STARS rating systems because I know it can be a real um, paradigm shift to think about um, I, I, my, my, for context, my dad uh, it works at used to is retired now, but used to work in healthcare quality and performance improvement. And um, so it's, it's kind of a, you know, he, he talked about pay for performance all the time. So it's, it's a big paradigm shift for people to think about, okay, we're not going to pay people more for better performance. And uh, yeah, no, actually I think it was the, the more racially equitable thing to do. So I don't know, just wanted to provide that context. No, thank you. That's great feedback. Thank you. Carolyn, can I just briefly add to, um, just to reinforce what Jay is saying and, and uh, share your enthusiasm, Jay, that, you know, the impact, the payment goes to the families. And so, you know, the impact um, for a family that can't find or doesn't have access to a high quality early childhood education or after school program um, is, is inequitable, right? And so um, that's another reason this is a great change. Thanks, Ann. Oh, yeah. So the other reason I want to build on what you said, Anne, just to 
make people think a little bit. The other reason why this is such a great change and not necessarily linking to some new quality measure yet is the value and the perceived measure of quality is again structured in white supremacy in our systems because we're saying we value X, Y, and Z. And yes, they may do quality care, but maybe that family really values having a provider that speaks their native language. And that's their measure of value um, or cooks halal food or things like that, that we're not measuring or thinking about that we really should be if we're really trying to figure out what families want and need. So thank you, Jay and Ann. Thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts? I'm curious, Carolyn, how you all are thinking about the upcoming increase for family, the additional increase for family child care homes and how the timing of that, you know, won't align with the data that you're using from December or January. Yeah, um, so it's it would still be so it's going to be in um, in October. No, I'm sorry, in July, July 1st. Um, so we are still currently at the percentile that we need to be. Um, and, you know, the legislature is the one who mandated the not there not to be a, more than a 50% difference between family child care homes and registered um, or licensed centers. Um, so my thought is that like, we would be able to, when we have this RFP enacted and somebody in place, like we'll, we'll have like even more real time data. I'm hoping that like, we'll even have it for next legislative season. Um, getting them on board this fall methodology um, and their first round of um, cost of care analysis and provider rates to be able to give to the legislature next next season. Anna, did I answer your question? I feel like I didn't really. <laughs> no, that was that was good. I'm happy to hear that you're aiming to have that data by next legislature. Yeah, season. yeah. Like Just looking at the comment there. I think now I've gone over time. So, um, but please, uh, we really will. Sorry, Nora. Nope. No. <laughs> I was just going to say we really would welcome feedback. Um, again, if you if you have time to review and let us know, um, and I really appreciate your time and and letting us have some time on the agenda today. Wonderful. Thanks for using using this group. Um, we definitely welcome that. And I think the expertise is evident. Um, I um, will send out the, uh, the two documents you referenced along with the um, along with emails in case there's follow up questions or or comments. And we'll look forward to um, to seeing to seeing the the upcoming report and full state plan. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dora. Yeah, thanks. So I think before we get to general updates, uh one of the things that uh we have continually and that we've been talking about for the past year and a half or more um is about um equitable and accurate demographic data collection. We've been talking about it a lot today in terms of what um, representation looks like and how we're and and what that what that means and all of our different suppression rules, et cetera. Um, and so I am putting out uh, a call for volunteers for a subcommittee to be able to move from problem identification to to action, whether it's small or uh, longer longer term. So, if you are interested, um, you can volunteer right now in front of everyone, or you can let me know. Um, think a little bit about it. 
I don't have the details. It wouldn't be, um, and recognizing everybody has, has limited capacity. Um, but I do think that this is something that this committee has really been focused on, but we've been stuck in the, in the problem identification stage. And so really wanting a small group of us to be able to come together to, um, to take action. Um, okay. Kaya. Awesome. It'll be wonderful to have your voice at the table. I will say, though, I'm not probably going to be available till May. So if you do it before then, we have an issue. That's fine. Okay. Um, while everyone's thinking about that or has already th decided not to volunteer, um, the we want to do some... Uh, data updates, so or early childhood system updates. Love to hear what's going on uh, in, in your world. Are there surveys going out? Are there reports that just got released? I saw there was, there were a couple of things referenced around uh, the health department having a new strategic plan. That's really exciting. Um, and just seeing your um, uh, comment, Jay, Really appreciate all of the um, resources that you that you continue to to share with this group. Any any updates? I can just share a quick. Um, I know I mentioned uh, you know our, our quest for a new system in FSD, so the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information System or CWIS. Um, we've done a lot of uh, outreach um, with several of our partners. Building Bright Futures has been a huge, uh, huge partner in that process, um, and it seems like we're really getting some traction. Uh, just this week, um, the House Appropriations Committee was discussing how to allocate um, about $6 million um, tobacco money. And uh, I think it was last week, someone had reached out to me saying, hey, there's uh, you know questions or th thoughts about maybe some of that money going towards CWIS, maybe 3 million. Um, and it sounds like uh, at the committee meeting earlier this week, there were some conversations about potentially um, all of all of that money, or, or I think folks or some folks are advocating for that. Um, so really, any any money is great money, but uh, it does feel like a lot of our hard work is paying off this legislative season. Um, and you know, we know we we still won't have enough, um, but uh, it just it's nice to to get a little bit of representation um, and have folks kind of understand the importance of family services having a comprehensive um, child welfare information system. So. Hopefully, you know, continued updates to come there. Um, we actually, I want to say a week ago, week and a half, time flies these days. Um, we officially got our um, request for proposal, our RFP out for bid um, for CWIS. So that is now live. It is uh, officially the furthest FSD has ever been able to take this project. So again, just, um, you know, some, some big updates here, slow updates, long, long process, but um, yeah, just feeling a little bit more hopeful than it, than we have before. Congratulations. Thanks. It's a big, big milestone to be, be further along than ever before. It's quite the threshold. Terry. I'm not really a data, uh, update, but, uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Terry Hatap with the um, Vermont Department of Health, and I'm in the uh, research and statistics um, team with Peggy, and uh, I'm the new PG, uh, PDG grant uh, analyst, so looking forward to working with you guys. Welcome. Eric. Thank you. I just wanted to say, in, in relation to the meeting that uh, some of us had with the uh, Child Trends folks uh, the other day. I've been working with some of our new people here, both of whom are on the call. We have uh, Christina LeBlanc and Stephen Kirby, who've recently joined our units. And uh, we are putting together uh, the baseline data for you know, prior to Act 76, so we can actually see you know, some measurable movements in, in either direction. You know, Hopefully it's all up, but you know, the data will tell us. 
but I, I wanted to take the opportunity not just to say yes we're doing that but to introduce uh, Christina and Stephen to the group here since they'll be doing a lot of that very important work with us. Wonderful. Welcome. Welcome all. It's it's really nice to see so many uh, new folks on, on the call today. Um, either Eric or, or Anna, do you want to just give a tiny update on what the child trans work is? I'm happy to. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, at Building Bright Futures, along with the CDD team, are partnering with um, a research team at Child Trends who has a federal grant over the next several years to study the impact of changes made it made to CCFAP payment policies. Um, so as Eric referenced, his team is busy working on uh, supporting CDD with getting access to important administrative data to evaluate the, the program and it's the impact to these changes over time. Um, and then our team is working closely with Child Trends to develop some focus group protocols as well as some surveys for future years um, that we'll be serving uh, and talking to both families experiencing these changes as well as um, early educators um, and the impact of the changes on, on their end of things. So we're super excited. There certainly will be more to come and we'll report back to this group um, when, when it is, when we have things to share. Thanks, Anna. Emily. Uh, two really brief updates. Um, our, the, our Title V needs assessment is underway in the Division of Family and Child Health over at BDH. We are going to be collecting quite a bit of quantitative, uh, qualitative data, pardon me, um, in this cycle because we have found ourselves to be falling into a trend of collecting the same quantitative data from the same folks over and over again that just restates the needs that we are already aware of. So we're digging a little bit deeper trying to identify what we don't know, identify successes and barriers, and also hear from folks that we haven't heard before uh, from before historically. Um, so reaching outside our, our more traditional partner pool into different areas of the state, into different groups and communities to, to get some insights into new perspectives and new needs. Um, so in addition to that work, we are also currently in the grant application process for a maternal health innovation grant. And that will have a heavy, hopefully if we get it, fingers crossed, we'll have a heavy focus on um, data mapping, data landscape mapping in uh, the maternal mortality and morbidity space and innovative, innovative approaches to data integration and uh, data stewardship in the maternal health space. So looking to partner heavily with our folks over at VCHIP um, and any other partners in the perinatal space on that. So it's a little bit smaller than our massive early childhood scope here, but we're hoping that within that first year, if we get the grant, we'll be able to make some, some decent moves and have some lessons learned that we could potentially bring back to this group here. Exciting and, uh, Wonderful to hear that um, with the sort of new approach to the needs assessment in terms of um, really gaining new per new perspectives and recognizing the limitations of the of the traditional um, traditional efforts. Anything from AOE? Dun, dun, dun. Um, I, well, I, I guess we're going to push out a Ready for Kindergarten report for this year, um, which actually um, to some people seemed a little early, but it actually is the timeline that we initially intended to be pushing out that data. So happy about that. Um, Grant Cotherman is here today. He is a new AOE employee. He is a PDG analyst person. So he's been uh, learning about Ready for Kindergarten as the report goes out. He's also been, uh, <clears throat> you know, working with some of the early learning staff 
to understand um, what goes on in some of the uh, pyramid uh, sites. Uh, there's a tool called PIDS that pulls together a bunch of data that about 39 preschools are using that um, grant is going to help with um, Title II and for reporting on the project, on the process there. Um, there's probably a lot of other data flows happening. Um, one that's also interesting, I heard somebody mention workforce. Um, I am participating in a national work group to take the current data standards and be able to sort of pre-specify for states the um, how you get the workforce outcomes from the uh, current data standard model. So sort of putting the theoretical ETL for any one system in place so that you can grab it from a Git repository and uh, modify it to meet your own system needs. Awesome. Welcome, welcome all. Um, uh, uh, yeah. ETL is just, you know, uh, what does it stand for? Um, transform and load um, and error detection, stuff like that, Jay. So just once you get raw data, it's not ready for what we would call a uh, reporting data store. And theoretically, data in a reporting data store environment should be something that we would be able to expose, um, you know, to the public or to uh, stakeholder groups, things like that, through tools like Power BI. Sure. Okay. Morgan, do you have some BBF updates? I feel like I've talked so much today. I feel bad like taking more time during this meeting, but I think um, a couple of the things that I want to make sure that people know about, especially because we talked about ways to centralize early childhood data that I hope everybody on this call at the very least has seen Vermont's early childhood data portal. Quick show of hands. Okay. That's not awful, <laughs> but let's... Let's start. Uh, we're going to be doing more communications about this body of work and, and really be thinking about, again, what are all of the different ways that we can help support you all, especially those of you who are in state government and in helping make that data publicly accessible and meaningful um, and helping you all tell the story of the incredible work that your teams are doing. So really excited about um, this new portal as a way to centralize that information alongside the state of Vermont's children. Um, and really excited to have so many new PDG folks in the room. I know those of you who are new data stewards may not uh, be fully integrated into all of your different roles and responsibilities, but we're really excited to have you as part of this early childhood data team that we are building for the state to understand uh, what the needs and challenges are on behalf of kids and families and how we, how we can use data to inform and drive decision making. Um, so really excited to have new capacity and new team members to be able to do that work really well. And um, if you have not met with Dora yet, Dora and Kitty and Valerie and Jen from the Building Bright Futures team, definitely um, take some time just to learn a little bit more about the work of Building Bright Futures in, um, in this data arena, because we are really excited to have you. Dora, any other data updates versus BBF updates? Or Kitty? Um, I think the the only thing is to say that the data portal, uh, we are continuously adding more data. We wanted to get a, a chunk of information out, but we're adding new, um, Kitty is taking the lead on adding a bunch of uh, data sets on a 
regular basis. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to, to be centralizing this information. Um, so that's, that's just a, a caveat and a also let us know if there are things that are, are missing in case that they're not on our, on our queue already. I feel like I should have had a queued up, um, list of announcements, but I don't have, I don't have one. Okay. Any other announcements? We are um, trying to end meetings with um, the opportunity for synthesizing if there were elements from today's conversation that uh, should be sort of highlighted around uh, for potential um, policy recommendations. I don't know that there was anything that, um, I mean, our, again, the um, uh, prioritizing qualitative data and, and ensuring that um, the, um, uh, that voices aren't, aren't lost continues to, it, I, I would imagine that um, that our recommendations that will will come back to this group that have been included for the past two years to see if they are still if they need to be reworked. But again, that like um, uh, that sentiment continues to be uh, a policy priority. Jay. Um, thank you. I I just. Um... I uh, had a brief aside with Tiffany after she left the meeting and um, she and I are both excited about um, the idea that we can build on previous work and not have to sort of reinvent the wheel. So we're both excited to learn more about the, the Early Childhood Data Governance Council that, you know, let's, let's keep, that, keep that alive. <clears throat> Pardon me. Absolutely. Um, continuous quality improvement in action, right? Where we don't need to reinvent the wheel and we also don't need to be doing things in in silos. I think part of what we're what we're we're hoping to get from from you all, we started to get a little bit about the the data linking and um is that there are these little little pieces that are um that are happening, right? It's it's the um uh the family services and Dale coming together and using manual lookups and the same thing with Diva and AOE using Medicaid direct certification, right? We're doing this linking in small pockets. And so where are the opportunities for us to learn the lessons? from each other where are the opportunities for us to say like this stalled and didn't work and where what are the lessons there as well so i think that we are really trying to to lean into that and also um want to make sure that we aren't you know there's a lot of people with fresh eyes here and a lot of people with historical uh context and having both of those together is really a um a strength of this committee so looking forward to um being able to to build rather than reinvent so one of the things that that came up from several colleagues on the phone was uh funding and capacity and leadership and really saying you know we need to prioritize this and make progress so i can imagine uh, that has come through in some of our policy recs in past years and whether or not this is a more concrete opportunity to revitalize that one um, and and put it in front of, you know, back in front of the legislature in in meaningful ways. Uh, but also our, our new agency leaders, there's an opportunity to orient them to the importance of this work. And the only other thing I want to name is we, we've talked about... Um, like we keep we keep saying building bright futures, and I think one of the interesting things about um, 
building bright futures is we see that as all of you like this committee this group of data stewards and and partners is the you know the strategic plans um committee that's coming together to to problem solve in each of these areas right so i think sometimes when we're saying building bright futures we're actually talking about a broader group not just the building bright future staff so i just wanted to to name that for this group because um, the, the reason all of this work does take place is because there's partnerships among our teams to make it happen and, and really recognizing that we are seeing you as part of that really critical fabric and network. And with that, I'm going to say that, uh, our next meeting is June 21st, um, from one to two 30 and, we look forward to seeing you then. We will send out uh, the notes and a request for more information uh, to keep gathering that, that baseline um, to be able to learn from. Thanks all. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>